Um, right, so now I would like to analyze these self-shrinkers. Um, and the, so the self-shrinkers uh, are, um, so we're, we're looking at the time minus one slice, but the self-shrinkers are these self-similar solutions of the mean curvature flow, which as time changes just dilate. They disappear, we, we, we've normalized, so they disappear at the origin. Um, and uh, of course you could translate them around. Um, and these things arise as blow-ups near a singularity. So understanding these in some sense allows you to, to understand the singularities. In the type one case, that's 100% right. Uh, these completely describe the type one singularities. Uh, even in the type two case, they arise, but then typically they arise as bracky limits, possibly with multiplicity. And then there's some question as to whether there is that multiplicity. That's a conjecture of, of Tom Millman. In. Okay, so these self-shrinkers are, are linked to understanding the singularities of mean curvature flow. We'd like to understand the self-shrinkers. We've seen numerical evidence that there are a lot of them, uh, including uh, some extremely convincing pictures. Uh, so now in order to understand the self-shrinkers, br we bring in this functional. So this time minus one slice uh, arises as a, a critical point to this, this functional here, these F functionals. The F functionals we bring with two parameters, this X0 and T0. Uh, and we think of these as giving us this, the center. So X0 is the center where the, this Gaussian uh, integral is centered. And T0 is the scale on which you're working. Okay, then we saw we, when we computed the first variation of these functionals that the critical points were indeed self-shrinkers. And this was true even when we allowed variations of all three parameters simultaneously. Okay, so you could say, well, that doesn't add anything to the picture. Um, and at this point, it doesn't, because in the first variation, those drop out. But when we compute the second variation, then those quantities will add something to the picture. Okay, and so this was the first variation formula. Uh, just to, okay, so here's, this is the first derivative. There. So the next thing, just like we did for harmonic functions and uh, the curve, you know, geodesics, and we did for minimal surfaces, the next thing that we are, we're gonna start doing is computing the second variation. Okay, so we wanna see what that formula looks like and, and see what it, it tells us, what we can learn from it. Okay, so this was again this proposition that the self-shrinkers are critical points. So uh, we'll start to compute the second variation. Um, so there's some operators that uh, turn up in the second variation. So we're gonna do a brief aside in order to understand these operators so they don't just come flying at us out of nowhere so we know what, what to expect. Uh, by the way, after we do the second variation, I'm gonna uh, take a little detour and explain a compactness theorem for, for all self-shrinkers in R3, which also relies on the second variation formula, and then we'll return to, to using the second variation to understand the, uh, the uh, stable critical points. Okay, so let's go back actually to this formula here. You'll notice that the, inter the integrals that show up uh, in this functional, all have this Gaussian weight in there. So I can think of this integral, um, so this has, integral has three terms. I can think of each of these three terms as being a weighted inner product in this weighted L2 space with the Gaussian weight. Okay, so let's look at that Gaussian weight. So we consider an inner product of, of the, this L2 inner product with the weighted, the weighted Gaussian in the integral, and there's a corresponding one that you can do with gradients. This one with the Oh, either one of these, is, is certainly, this is a symmetric, bi, you know, bilinear form. Okay, it's obviously symmetric in F and G. Okay, so this symmetric bilinear form should be able to, to, to be represented by a nice second order operator. In other words, I should be able to take one of those integrals, say, take the integral off of, of F, that gradient, integrate by parts and throw it on the other side of the equation. That's typically how if you take grad F dot grad G and without a weight, then the integration by parts would bring up a Laplacian. Okay, and so then you would say the Laplacian is a nice symmetric second order operator. In this case, if we integrate by parts, so we take, the, you know, take a gradient off of one, that means we end up having to, uh, the divergence, instead of just hitting the gradient of F, also hits this weight. Okay, so the product rule, we get two terms. So the operator that arises naturally is, is what's called a drift Laplacian. We'll call it script L. Um, the these operators are studied, uh, you know, they're studied in analysis. They also arise in the Ricci flow. The same thing there, where the, um, but instead of taking, instead of that Gaussian weight, the Gaussian weight would be the one uh, uh, Natasha was, was dealing with before, when you take like e to the, the minus f, where f is the, uh, uh, is, say, 
um, say if you have a gradient, a uh, soliton, and then f is the, the function that it's a gradient of. Okay, so, um, right, so we get this operator, uh, script L, and so this L, this operator L is automatically is uh, self-adjoint in the weighted space. Just to remind you, if you ha uh, in terms of an ordinary, um, ordinary operators without the weight there, then if you have a first order term, uh, typically it's shot, right? It's not a symmetric operator. Symmetric operators cannot have odd, you know, these odd order terms. So, um, right, so, so the fact that you have this first order term coming in here means that this operator L is not symmetric um, by the usual, in the usual sense, but it is symmetric with respect to this weighted L2 inner product. And why is that? Okay, so this equation here is saying that G, the inner, um, I'm assuming that something has compact support so I can integrate by parts. Then this is that G integrated against script L of F uh, is equal to minus just the weighted inner product of f and g. The left-hand side is obviously symmetric with respect to switching f and g, so therefore so is the right-hand side. So this script L operator is symmetric in the weighted space. This will be important later when we want to do some spectral theory, because we'd like to look at the, the eigenfunctions for this operator, and as long as you have a, a nice symmetric operator, then linear algebra is, is, going to, is telling us that you can expect to find this uh, you know, complete basis of orthonormal eigenfunctions. At least on a compact in a compact setting. Okay, this script, this uh, drift operator, script L, plays the role for self shrinkers um, that the Laplacian does for minimal surfaces. So, um, just to remind you, first, anytime uh, you have a submanifold, then the Laplacian on a function f is given by tracing out the Hessian, but then now just tracing over the tangent space to the submanifold, and then subtracting off. The, the mean curvature times the uh, normal uh, part of the, the gradient. So taking this formula and sticking in the self-shrinker equation, which tells us what h is in terms of the normal, then it turns out that the coordinate functions are now eigenfunctions of script L. Okay, so for a minimal surface, coordinate functions were harmonic, restricted to the surface. For a self-shrinker, coordinate functions are eigenfunctions, uh, with, uh, in, in this case, eigenvalue minus a half. Um, okay, and, and if you look at mod x squared and you apply script L, it turns out to be equal to 2n minus mod x squared. Uh, by the way, uh, so one thing, so interesting uh, question. So suppose you, were, you wanted to look, let's just talk about on Euclidean space now. Look at the operator script L on Euclidean space, and you wanted to look at solutions of this. Like, so we know the coordinate functions give us polynomially growing solutions to this eigenfunction equation of script L. I'll ask the question, suppose I want to look at all polynomially growing eigenfunctions to script L. Give me a bound on the growth and a bound on the eigenvalue. It turns out that the space of those is finite dimensional, which uh, actually follows from something uh, Maria proved. So if you think of that, because those guys, these script L, these are exactly, uh, eigenfunctions for script L exactly correspond to homogeneous solutions of the heat equation uh, once you bring in the time parameter. Okay, so anyway, that's a funny coincidence. The, these guys really are. So, um, okay, uh, in terms of connecting things up, let me just, uh, again, this analogy that we have in mind. We think of minimal, uh, so we have this analogy with minimal surfaces. If you have a minimal surface, then there are these cones. Corresponding to the cones, uh, you can now look at the link. So you intersect with a sphere and study the spherical minimal submanifolds. In the sphere, if you have an eigenfunction on the sphere, that becomes a separation of variables a harmonic function on the cone. The corresponding thing here, so in the mean curvature flow, we think of these guys as, as being cones over the time minus one slice with respect to parabolic scaling. Homogeneous solutions of the heat equation in space and time correspond to eigenfunctions of the L operator on the time minus one slice. Okay, so this, uh, of course, is going to be more difficult to deal with th than it, it would be in the minimal surface case because there the, the, uh, the intersection with the sphere had the nice uh, advantage of being compact, whereas here the time minus one slice is a non-compact space. If you try to do spectral theory on a non-compact space, uh, you know, it can 
be substantially, substantially more difficult. So for instance, you know, you, instead of having a complete basis of eigenfunctions, you might have continu you know, typically continuous spectrum and all kinds of, maybe even embedded eigenvalues, all kinds of horrible spectral things can, can happen. Or uh, maybe some people think they're lovely uh, spectral things. How about unfamiliar spectral things? Okay, so uh, let's just, again, we want to think of using this L operator uh, and the coordinate functions and the square, you know, the mod, you know, mod x squared, uh, much as we would use it for minimal surfaces. So let me remind you of this formula. So we had this miracle, what, what at first appeared to be a miracle, I guess well, let's back up again to the first variation formula. Okay, so in the first variation formula, remember I told you if, if it's a self-shrinker, the second two terms always drop out. H here is a constant, I might as well bring it outside of the integrand. So and, and let me plug in x0 equal to 0 and t0 equal to 1, and you see the integral of x mod x squared over 4 minus n over 2 is always 0 on a self-shrinker. We, so, we realized that, we showed that was the case just by a simple uh, variational argument, realizing that this corresponded to uh, dilations, but dilations, you know, changing the t0 could just as easily have been taken care of by dilating the surface itself in a corresponding way. So, so we saw for variational reasons that integral had to be 0. Now let's see uh, directly by analyzing this L operator why it has to be 0. Okay, so here, so we'd like to show this integral is 0 on a self-shrinker, followed by combining two things. The first is that if we apply L to, to mod x squared, we just get 2n minus x squared. And the second is L is symmetric. So let me uh, plug in u equal to 1 and v equals mod x squared. When I do that, on the right-hand side, I get 0 because the derivative of, of 1 is 0. On the left-hand side, I get uh, the weighted integral of 2n minus x squared. So this fact that, um, that this integral is 0 actually comes right out from, from these proper, the properties of the L operator, too, and, the, and, and what you get when you apply it to mod x squared just in terms of connecting things up. Okay, so I'm getting a, a bad sense that I may have beaten uh, at least two-thirds of you into submission or something. I think there are signs of life. Uh, this might sound okay. Right. Yeah, it's this horrible uh, thing that people who, who haven't seen some of this before, uh, possibly I'm... Um, you know, throwing too many formulas up too quickly. And for those of you who have seen this, some of this before, I'm throwing too many familiar formulas up too slowly. So <laughs> somewhere, maybe it meets in the middle. Um, I guess maybe it did meet in the middle. Everybody can be bored. <laughs> okay, so look, let's look at the L operator here. So this script L operator, again, just to where are we going? We, we bring in this operator, which plays the role of the Laplacian, and uh, we're building towards a second variation formula. Well, in the second variation formula for minimal surfaces, it's not just the Laplacian that comes in. What comes in is this Jacobi operator, a second variation operator, Laplacian plus mod a squared. There's going to be a corresponding second variation operator that shows up here. So that second variation operator we're going to call L, not script L, but regular L. And that operator is going to have the following form. It's going to be uh, script L, so that'll be the second and first order part, and then a zeroth order part, which is mod a squared plus a half. Mod a squared is familiar, the half maybe is a little strange. So uh, that half actually is somehow is coming from time scaling. The, um, the first part, the grad, the, the, the first order term is coming from scalings in space. The zero order term of a half is coming from scalings in time. Um, roughly speaking, that's where it comes from. I mean, well, where it comes from is direct calculation, but if you wanted to explain why it's coming in, that's why it's coming. Okay, so this operator, well, script L, the, 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 differ, the differential part of the operator, already was symmetric with respect to the weighted inner product. So if I add a zeroth order term, that's just multiplication by a function. So this L is also symmetric. And this, this is going to play the same role that the second variation operator does in minimal surfaces. Okay, so now uh, time to compute the second variation. So again, I want to, sigma 0 is a self-shrinker and all the usual things. We have a unit normal n, some function f that's going to be the, how we vary it. Uh, and then we're going to simultaneously vary um, x sub s and t sub s. 
y is, this vector y is how I'm varying x sub s, and the constant h is how I'm varying the, the scale t sub s. When I vary all three of these things at once, we've already shown that at, on a self-shrinker, the, the first derivative, the first variation is 0. So now the second variation is given by this formula. So we have this 4 pi to the minus n over 2 that comes out the front. Again, we get this weighted integral. So you see the Gaussian weight on the right-hand side. At this point, hopefully you, you've uh, come to ignore everything except what's in between the rounded brackets. And we now see five terms. So let's try to understand each of these terms. So the last four of them are only there because I'm varying x uh, and t also. The last four terms all have an h or a y in them. So if h or y is 0, in other words, I'm not varying the functional, I'm just varying the surface, those four terms are gone. So let's look at the first term. This is the one that com really comes from varying the surface. This is exactly what we expect. This is an exact analog with what you see in the second variation formula, for either for geodesics or for minimal surfaces. You get this operator L, and it's applied to F, and then dotted with minus F. So that really is the second variation operator. And L, again, is this operator we wrote down before. It's script L plus A squared plus a half. OK, then we have these other terms. Um, we have two square terms. Okay, this, these two negative terms are both squares. Those are obviously negative. Uh, and the first, uh, right, and so here we have an, an integral of, of h squared and an integral of y dot n squared. And then we have two cross terms. So we have this f h, you know, so this where these, where the change in s mixes with the change in t. And then we have one where the, the change in sigma, sorry, mi mixes with the uh, change in x. This is the change in sigma. So, OK, you'll notice there's a missing cross term in this expression. There should be another cross term which involves a y and an h together. But that one's missing. We'll, I'll come back and explain why that term is missing. OK, so right. So this is, this is the formula for the second variation of this f functional when we vary everything. By the way, uh, right off, suppose I didn't vary sigma at all. So in other words, I took f equal to 0. If I take f equal to 0, what I get is negative. OK, so I have minus h squared h squared and minus y dot n squared over 2. This is another indication of this horrible lack of, of real stability. OK, so none of these critical points are in any sense minima. They're all high, very unstable. Because just by changing the functional, just by changing the, the x0 and t0, it always goes down. And as we said, changing x0 and t0, those correspond to translations and dilations. So that means that if I was to stick translations or dilations into the variation of sigma and leave the other guys fixed, it would also go down. OK, so now let's, uh, let's use this formula to see why they're all unstable. So we'll just take a, let's suppose, um, I'm going to assume it's compact just because I don't want to worry about integrating by parts, uh, you know, or worry about uh, killing off boundary terms. And so in this case, let's look at a variation. Here, I've just recalled the formula for you from the previous slide. And now let's look at a variation where we just vary by the 1, we vary, just vary by the, in the unit normal direction. Well, if I apply the operator L to 1, well, the differential part of the operator, of course, is 0. And so I'm left with mod a squared plus a half. Because I have that minus sign in there, this integral is always negative. So every single self-shrinker is unstable for this functional. Notice even if a is 0, so even if you're on the plane, it's still unstable. OK, there's that minus a half in there. Everything is unstable. OK, well, actually, let me go back one, to, uh, one, more, one more thing to say about that. Uh, the, the, the fact that all of these are unstable, so let's go back and remember, so if you wanted to, self-shrinkers were minimal surfaces for some funny metric. So you could imagine trying variationally, we, and we said there's a, a real paucity of, uh, or scarcity of self-shrinkers that have been proven to exist. Well, how might you try to construct them given that they're minimal? You might try variational arguments. So um, sort of thing, suppose you might, like the way we, you, you we found geodesics on a torus, 
by minimizing the length in a homotopy class. The fact that all of these are unstable means that you can't get them by looking for any minima. If you want to find them, you have to find them by looking at saddle points, unstable critical points of the functional. Right? And so, uh, if you'll recall Camilo's talk, it can be very difficult to find unstable critical points, especially embedded ones. Okay, so the, uh, you know, up, uh, not much was known before Pitts around 1980 in terms of finding those by variational argument. Okay, so let's try to understand this operator a little bit more again. A and there's a, a nice kind of miracle that happens. So the first thing is uh, the function h, so this is the mean curvature on a self-shrinker, this turns out to be an eigenfunction for this operator l. This is very much the analog of uh, Simon's uh, uh, identity for, the, uh, if for a minimal surface. So he has a nice formula if you ap apply the second variation operator, Laplace n plus mi to a squared, let's say in Euclidean space, to the second fundamental form as a tensor, then, then it turns out satisfying, uh, you know, being, being in, the, in the kernel of that. So this nice equation, nice uh, differential equality for the, the full second fun fundamental form. They're corresponding versions of that Simon's identity that play a big role in a lot of these uh, geometric problems. So for instance, for Einstein manifolds, you get something similar. There's a set, this uh, uh, operator, and if you look at, you know, um, right, okay, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Then there's, there are similar formulas for, for these other, other settings. Uh, in Ricci flow, there's a, a similar formula. In mean curvature flow, there's something similar. In our setting, uh, what we get is that this operator L is the right thing to look at, and if you apply L to H, it just gives you back H. So this says that H is an eigenfunction for L. And with this horrible convention that we're using for eigenfunctions, so, so um, we'd like the, all the eigenvalues to be positive for the Laplacian. So we declare something to be an eigenfunction um, if, of, with, of, of eigenvalue minus 1 if L of H is equal to H, just to recall that convention. So H is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue minus 1. Now, if Y is a constant vector field in Rn plus 1, and I take the normal part of it, it turns out that L of Y is 1 half L of y dot n is one half y dot n. So these, um, the normal part of, of a, a translation vector field is again an eigenfunction, this time with eigenvalue minus a half. Okay, so this, uh, now just to remind you of something, if you have um, a symmetric operator and eigenfunctions with two distinct eigenvalues, they have to be orthogonal. Okay, so this means that y dot n and h are orthogonal in this weighted uh, inner product. Okay, well that explains a mystery that we had a couple of slides ago. You'll, there was no term involving h and y dot n in the second variation formula. Well, there is such a term, it's just that the integral of it is zero. Okay, so uh, that explains that, that mystery. That's one of those where uh, the first time you calculate it and you see you're missing a term, you go back and, and, and calculate it again. And, and the term is, is uh, still missing, and then you get very worried and not sure what you don't understand. <laughs> and then uh, hopefully the mystery is sometime explained. Okay, so now. Okay, so, uh, that's, uh, so that's the second variation operator. We've seen that everything is unstable for that second variation operator. And, um, okay, so of course that's a little bit mysterious because we already know uh, from, from Huyskin's result that if you have a round sphere, and you perturb it a little bit, then the blow up uh, is still going to be a round sphere. So a shrinking sphere appears like it, it is a stable critical point. Okay, it cannot be perturbed away. So from this point of view of flows, somehow the, it should be a, a minimizer. Okay, on the other hand, everything is unstable. So we have to reconcile those two things. We're going to need to understand that. The, the mystery there is that being a stable, being a uh, a sphere, having a sphere as a singularity is a stable property. But having a sphere as a singularity at this point of space and time is an unstable property. So that instability of the sphere corresponds to the fact where it disappears, and at what point in space and at what time it disappears, that moves around as you wiggle the sphere. The sphere. It always disappears at a, at a round point, but the point is not stable. So if you just think about it for a second, um, suppose you're in, you're doing this, this flow in R3, that gives you at least three, so for the point R3 and then one, four, that gives us at least an, an index of four 
for the lack of, of stability. Okay, so uh, again, we're going to come back to, to try to understand that, and that's going to be the key for, for saying something about uh, generic singularities. Um, but I wanted to, um, now that we have the second variation operator, and I, we've just explained that everything is unstable for it, I want to uh, talk about a compactness theorem, which, which uses that second variation operator. Okay, so in R3, um, if you look at, at the self-shrinkers, we basically, we can give a complete list of the ones that are known to exist. Uh, the embedded ones, there's a plane, there's a cylinder, there's the sphere, and there's Anganin's donut. So there are four known self-shrinkers. Okay, so uh, we'll prove a compactness theorem for all four. <laughs> so this, uh, the, the interest of this compactness theorem, of course, is that we hope, uh, expect that there are many others that have been numerically shown, uh, or numerically indicated to exist, but aren't known. But once, once one has all of those, then, then the compactness is probably even more interesting. Uh, but here, so this is a compactness theorem for the space of self-shrinkers that are smooth, complete, embedded, no boundary. They have genus at most g, and we assume some bound on their, their, uh, uh, the Gaussian integral. Okay, so give me a fixed bound on the Gaussian integral and a fixed bound on the genus, then that space is smoothly compact. So what does that mean, smoothly compact? It means that if you give me a sequence of them, that, that I can find a subsequence that converges smoothly and with multiplicity one on, any, on all compact sets. Okay, so the, the ordinary sense of what a compactness theorem means, and compactness in the smooth topology. Okay, so for those of you coming from, from the minimal surfaces world, which is a, a good number of you, uh, that would uh, probably imme immediately make you think of the Choi-Shane compactness theorem. So Choi and Shane proved that if you're in a manifold, um, let's say a three manifold with positive Ricci curvature, then the space of embedded minimal surfaces with a fixed bound on genus alone is smoothly compact. Okay, so that, there they use the, the positive Ricci curvature. Uh, that, that's really essential. That can, uh, that can be used to get the proof in one of two ways. One way um, is that uh, uh, there's a result of Choi and Wang, which uh, says that the, the positive Ricci implies an area bound immediately. And now, once you have that area bound, the only thing you really need to worry about is multiplicity of convergence. Okay, there'll be, uh, a, a, um, okay, and so that's the multiplicity that needs to be wor uh, ruled out. The way that they do that is, is they actually show that if you have multiplicity, there's an eigenvalue that's going to zero. And, um, and Choi and Wang actually proved the area bound uh, by, by getting a lower bound for the first eigenvalue, so that's impossible. Okay, but positive Ricci is, is the key. Unfortunately, so these guys are minimal surfaces, but in this funny metric, this metric does not have positive Ricci curvature. Not only does it not have positive Ricci curvature, but the scalar curvature in some places goes to minus infinity. You know, if you take the, um, so it's definitely very much not positive Ricci curvature. So this is quite, this is quite different. Okay, so I'd like to explain how this result goes and tie it in with, with the uh, stability operator. Okay, so there are five, five steps. The first four are, are uh, pretty standard, and the fifth is uh, moderately standard. So let me uh, explain them uh, in order. The first thing is, that this bound on the f-functional gives local area bounds. It's Gaussian dec uh, you know, decay, but in each compact set, it gives you a bound for the area. Uh, the next thing is that if you have a bound for the genus, so now I'm working in a small ball, I have a bound for the genus, and I have a bound for the area of the minimal surface in that ball, that implies that, say, on half the ball, there's a bound for the total curvature. So um, this is basically is coming out of the Gauss-Binet formula. If you control the genus and the area, you control the total curvature. Okay, so that, that's, uh, okay, so that's pretty standard. Um, okay, so now we have these local bounds on area and the integral of mod a squared. So let's look locally. So locally, remember, these things are just minimal surfaces for a funny metric. So I have a sequence of minimal surfaces with bounds on total curvature and bounds on area. So Choi and Shane, uh, they have a curvature estimate which says that if, if the total curvature in, in some ball is, is less than some epsilon, then in fact you get pointwise curvature bounds. So now, um, with that means there are at most finitely many points in each ball where the total curvature is concentrating. And away from those points, I have uniform estimates. Okay, so this means that I'm going to get smooth convergence 
with some finite multiplicity, it's a finite multiplicity because we have these local area bounds, uh, to a limiting um, minimal surface, uh, to a limiting self-shrinker that's going to be embedded. The singularities end up being removable because of you know, various removable singularity theorems. Um, and uh, I have this isolated set of bad points where the curvature uh, blew up along, this is all after passing into subsequences. Now the next thing to, to throw in there is if you look at a point, okay, so, so look at the limiting surface. That's a smooth surface, although the convergence may not be smooth. That smooth surface, uh, if you look in a neighborhood of a point, the, the area is almost equal to, you know, it's just everything's locally Euclidean, so the area is almost that of an ordinary disk. So Allard's theorem tells you that if the convergence was with multiplicity one, you get uniform estimates. Okay, so if there was multiplicity one convergence, you wouldn't have had a singularity at all. So therefore, the only way there's singu a singularity is if the, the, the multiplicity of the convergence is more than one. Okay, so that's the, the, fourth, the fourth step. So now, what we need to do is show that there could not have been convergence with multiplicity. So we need to rule out the multiplicity. The idea there is that if you have, uh, let's pretend first that there were no sing uh, singular points. So then you would have, if you had convergence with multiplicity, you have two sheets coming together. They're both solutions, they're both minimal surfaces. This is an argument I alluded to before. Um, the difference, if I look at them, the difference between them, that's almost a solution of the linearized equation. The linearized equation is the Jacobi equation. So that means now as these come together, I can rescale that difference and somehow extract a limiting solution of the linearized equation. Because of embeddedness, these two, the two sheets don't touch. So it's positive. So, so now on the limit, I would get a positive solution of the linearized equation. That implies stability. OK, so let's continue here. I, I, I already said most of these things. So as the two sheets come together, um, they're both graphs over the limiting surface. We'll pretend there are two, and, and there could be some finite number, in which case you just take the top and the bottom sheet. OK, the difference between these is a positive function. That, that's from embeddedness. right? It can't, if it was 0, then the two sheets would have to cross. But this is before the limit. That can't happen. Uh, so this function almost satisfies this, the linearized equation. The, linearized, the linearization of the self-shrinker equation is exactly the operator L. So these almost satisfy L of, of uh, wi equal to 0. Of course, the, the sheets are coming together, so wi is going to 0. So if I just took the limit of wi, it would be a nice solution. It would be a solution of, of L of w equal to 0, but it would just be identically 0. So the way you, you deal with that is you renormalize. So you fix a point, divide by the value at that point. This makes the sequence 1 at, at a point. So these are positive solution, solutions of an elliptic equation. They're equal to 1 at a point. The Harnack inequality gives you uniform bounds everywhere, you know, at least as, you, as long as you stay uh, you know, local. And so once you have uniform bounds, then elliptic theory gives you higher order estimates. And so our Zell-Ascoli theorem al allows you to uh, uh, take a, a limit of a subsequence. So a subsequence of these functions ui converges to a solution of lu equal to 0. It's a positive solution, because all of the uis are positive. And since it's a smooth limit, it's equal to, to 1 at the point p. So in other words, it really is positive. The, since all, all of, the, of the solutions were positive, in the limit, that only guarantees all of the solutions are non-negative. But then the fact that it's positive at a point in the Harnack inequality comes back and, and, and says it's actually positive. OK, so as we saw for minimal surfaces, if you have a function like this, a solution of the linearized equation that's positive, uh, that implies stability. So that means this operator L is non-negative. OK, so what did I leave out? I left out an isolated set of points where this, this limiting function u is not defined. But for stability, points are removable. They don't matter. You can use this, uh, the logarithmic cutoff trick, if you like, to remove the points. Actually, there's also an argument for showing that, that, that in fact, the functions have removable singularities there. You can you know, set up some foliations near the point and, and remove the singularities. OK, so now. Um, by assuming that the convergence was with multiplicity, in other words, consuming that the, uh, assuming that there were these singular points, uh, we managed to, to extract a limiting solution of L u equal to, positive solution of L of u equals 0, and, and that implies stability of the operator L. On the other hand, 
um, just a few slides ago, I, I explained to you why the operator L was definitely never stable. Of course, in order to uh, justify various integrations, um, you, know, you, you need to assume here that um, there's at least, say, exponential volume growth or something. In practice, you only work with things with Euclidean volume growth, but, but if, if it was exponential volume growth, that would be fine. Okay, so that's it. That's all there is to that, to that argument for showing the, uh, the, the compactness theorem. This gives a contradiction. Therefore, there could not have been multiplicity. Therefore, by Allard, there were no singularities at all. Therefore, the convergence was smooth convergence. And again, the key point is ruling out stable solutions. Um, if you look at the second variation formula, for, uh, then it's, it's evident for Ritchie cur manifolds, three manifolds with positive Ritchie curvature, because of that Ritchie curvature term in there, you cannot have stable solutions. That gives, that's a way to give it a different proof of the, of the choice chain theorem. Okay, uh, now, so that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say about that compactness theorem. And so now we're going to return to the main thread uh, of trying to understand these um, you know, generic singularities or, or a dynamical stability of, of singularities of the mean curvature flow. Um, just this, uh, as I said before, um, this instability is, uh, is one of the reasons why it's difficult to construct examples. Um, so for instance, as I said, even the sphere already has indexed at least four as a critical point, which means that, that, that to produce it, you would have to do um, a min-max argument over at least a four-parameter space, uh, which already is, is, is rather uh, you know, difficult. Okay, so now what's going to be the, the way, um, so, uh, right, so far I haven't even yet quite precisely stated this main theorem about the dynamical stability. The, the, the concept that, that we'll use to do that is something that we um, called the entropy, which is for no good reason at all and was uh, pro probably a horrible mistake because it makes people think of things in which it is not. Um, basically, uh, there's, a, there's a quantity which is monotone under a flow um, so there's only one name that, that jumped to mind. I guess if it been more creative, maybe we could have called it a, you know, Lyapunov functional or something, but, um, okay, so this, this, we'll define a quantity lambda, which we'll, I'll call it the entropy, but uh, it's, it's rather simple. It's just, we have these Gaussian integrals, which two, with two parameters, the point x0 and the scale t0, and now I'm just going to take the supremum over all possible points and all possible scales, and that gives me one number, um, and we'll call that number lambda, the entropy. Okay, so this is defined for any surface. Um, it doesn't have to be a self-shrinker or, or a slice of a mean curvature flow. What are the, the, the key properties of this functional? Okay, so the first property is that it's invariant under dilations, rotations, and translations. Well, that's precisely because we took the soup over all possible translations and dilations, and the original function we looked at was already invariant under rotations. Okay, so this is just by, basically we, we, we set it up to do that by taking this, this supremum. The second property, also it's all obviously non-negative, it's an integral of a, non, of, of a non-negative function. Uh, the second property is that it's non-increasing under mean curvature flow. That's just another way of, of uh, stating uh, Huiskin's monotonicity theorem. So he gives a formula for how each one of these evolves under the flow. And so by then uh, taking the soup over his formula, you recover that, that, that uh, the soup actually is monotone as well. Okay, so the entropy is monotone, uh, non-increasing under mean curvature flow. The third property is that if you have a self-shrinker, then its entropy is actually just equal to the F01 functional. Another way of saying that, that third one is that uh, if I take any x0 and t0, then f of x0, t0 is less than or equal to f01 on a self-shrinker. Okay, so this supremum is actually a maximum on self-shrinkers, and it occurs when x0 is 0 and t0 is 1. Okay, so this is this quantity, this entropy. It's just a supremum over all these Gaussian integrals. Um, okay, so this is something actually Natasha mentioned before. So so here I've written down several self-shrinkers. For self-shrinkers, uh, the entropy is just equal to the, the F01 functional, which we saw already self-shrinkers have a quality in Huiskin's monotonicity formula. 
so that F01 functional is nothing more than the Gaussian density at the origin, or maximal Gaussian density. Well, those quantities were computed um, for generalized cylinders, or so, in other words, for, for uh, spheres in all dimensions by Andrew Stone, um, 1994. So uh, here are a few of the numbers. So on R2, the entropy is 1. On a sphere, uh, of, in two dimensions, the entropy is uh, the 4 over E, which is you know, approximately 1.47. And on the cylinder, it's about 1.52. So actually, Andrew shows something uh, kind of neat. This entropy is decreasing as you increase n for a spheres. I think it, uh, now I'm actually not remembering for sure, but uh, I think that, in fact, the limit as n goes to infinity is the square root of 2. Uh, now, there's a general fact, which just comes from properties of Gaussian integrals, that if you take a product with r, you don't change the entropy. So this cylinder, um, let, so here, the, the, the unit circle has entropy 1.52. So in particular, the cylinder, R cross S1, has that entropy as well because of this general fact. These Gaussian integrals are uh, uh, sort of, they don't mind products. OK. Now, the entropy is monotone under the flow. What does, so what is one thing this says? So for instance, suppose you start with an initial surface whose entropy is 1.5. If your initial surface has entropy 1.5, then it is impossible to realize a cylinder as a tangent flow on that surface. The entropy can only go down under the mean curvature flow, so, and it's invariant under dilations. So in particular, blow-up pr uh, procedure, like taking tangent cones, can't make it go up. Okay, so the entropy, um, so if you know a bound for the entropy at some time, that controls the densities of all singularities in the future. So in particular, if I can bring the entropy down below the, the value of, of an entropy of a singularity, then I can rule out that singularity as ever coming back. Okay, so that's going to be the, the, the approach. This is the sort of the mean curvature flow reason um, you know, behind, that, that's the mean curvature flow input, input into it here. Um, now it's just a question of, you give me a surface, we look at its entropy, I try to bring it down. Okay, so if you give me a singularity that I don't like, I want to just perturb your surface a little bit by some compactly supported perturbation so that we now bring the entropy below that threshold. And then I know that if we now start the flow again, that singularity that I didn't like does not come back. Okay, so here's the, here's the theorem. So this is the precise theorem when we say that the only generic singularities are spheres, planes, and cylinders. Okay. So if you have a self shrinker, and it's not a plane, sphere, or cylinder, so cylinder here it just means a, a product of r to the k with s n minus k, a generalized cylinder, then there's an arbitrarily close um, perturbation where the entropy is less. In fact, if you're in R3, um, we can make this perturbation compactly supported. Okay, so if you are in higher dimensions, you, there's a little bit of there's something there that's a little bit annoying, but I, I won't won't get into that right now. Okay, so this this again should be contrasted with uh, with Huiskin's result. So if you have a sphere, this entropy is 1.47. If you wiggle it a little bit, then unless you actually keep it a sphere, the entropy is going to come up. It will go up. Any way you wiggle that, unless you make it take it to another sphere, the entropy only goes up. That's because his result says that the, the tangent flow is again going to be a sphere, which has that same entropy, 1.47. Along the mean curvature flow, the entropy is only going to go down. Okay, so any way I wiggle a sphere, if I don't keep it round, I make the entropy go up. This theorem says that if I have anything other than a plane sphere or cylinder, there's a way to wiggle it so the entropy goes down. And in fact, I can make it ar uh, arbitrarily nearby. So it, what we'll do there is actually we'll choose a continuous variation uh, sigma s, so that for every s not equal 0, the entropy of sigma s is actually less than that of, of sigma. That's how that's going to work. OK, so now I um, want to mention a, a technical uh, property here. 
So the entropy, working with the entropy as a functional is rather difficult because you take the supremum over all x0 and t0. So if you wanted to compute the second variation, you wouldn't get a nice local formula. You wouldn't get a nice local integral formula. Okay, so how are we going to, to deal with that? Well, we're going to go back to these f functionals and um, we're going to instead talk about something which, means, which is f stability. This is a technical notion. It would have very little interest except later I'll prove that understanding this allows us to understand the entropy. Okay, so now, again, as I've said too many times, uh, we've already shown that everything is unstable as a critical point of the, of the F01 functional. We'll say something is F stable if the only reason it's unstable is because of, of translations. Okay, so in the case of the sphere, the instability completely comes from translating in space and dilating, which means just translating in time. Because if the dilation means a sphere of a different radius, well, under the mean curvature flow, that's just because the sphere moves homothetically, that's just the slice at a different time. Okay, so translations in space and time give instability. We'll say it's F-stable if those are the only things that give instability. Precisely it mean, what, what it means is it's F-stable if whatever variation you choose, then you can choose variations of X and T so that it's non-negative. The second variation is non-negative. Okay, so uh, then it's, it's not hard to see that the sphere and Rn are F-stable. So in the case of the sphere, the, the instability completely comes from, um, from the translations. Uh, how, in the case of the sphere, how would you, that, the sphere is actually easier to see than Rn. In the, the case of the sphere, you have the second variation operator, and you, you completely know all of the eigenfunctions, you, all the spectral theory of the sphere. You just check the eigenfunctions, and you see the only ones that are below the, this, this threshold are exactly the ones which come from the the um, mean curvature, which is the, the dilations, and from the translation vector fields. Okay, remember, translation vector fields are eigenfunctions on, on the sphere. Um, right. Okay, so, uh, right, so now why? Okay, so F stability, as I said, it's sort of a technical notion. Uh, why is it important? Um, the reason it's important is the following theorem, which we call the splitting theorem. So we show that if you have a self-shrinker and it does not split off a line, so what's an example of one that splits off a line? Well, the cylinder, so S1 cross R. In higher dimensions, you could, so you take any self-shrinker you want, you can cross it with R or an R2 or R to the K, and that gives you another self-shrinker in higher dimensions. Those split. We don't, I don't want to worry about those right now because those are really lower dimensional self-shrinkers, and to understand them, to understand the cylinder, you shouldn't work in R3, you should work in R2. Okay, it's just a product in the other direction. It's trivial in the other direction. Okay, so if you have a self-shrinker that does not split off a line and it is F unstable, then you can find a compactly supported variation, sigma S, so that the entropy has its maximum, strict maximum, at S equals zero. Okay, so these compactly supported variations are just graphs. They're compactly supported, uh, so they are graphs over the original one where they're equal, sigma s is equal to sigma zero, except inside a compact set where we vary it. Okay, so what's the, the idea of, of the splitting theorem? Okay, so the, uh, why, did, why is it important that it splits? Okay, so what is annoying about the cylinder when you, when you want to work with it? So, so the entropy, we want to bring the entropy down. On the unit sphere, um, so, if you, so if you have a sphere, then the entropy is achieved at the origin. So F01 achieves the entropy. And in fact, the entropy is, is less. You can check the entropy is, uh, or the F functional is less if you evaluate it anywhere else. On a cylinder, we have this translation invariance. So if you look at any point along the axis of the cylinder, the F functional uh, at, at the appropriate scale centered there all achieves the same value. So that entropy is achieved along the whole line. If I wanted to bring the, that down, I would have to bring down all of these simultaneously. So, um, so if it is a product, that, that's a real issue. Now you might worry about, suppose you have one that's not a product. Um, well, what if the entropy is achieved at other points, centered at other points or at other scales? That, that would uh, be most unfortunate. But, but the first thing we do is we show that if, it do, if that happens, then it splits. So, if sigma does not split off a line, 
then f01 is a strict maximum for the f-functionals. Maximum here as I vary x0 and t0. The fact that, um, yeah, okay, I'll leave that. that. Actually, that's not, not hard to see. If you had a compact, so closed, uh, so a compact and no boundary self-shrinker, that actually follows pretty easily from Huysgen's monotonicity formula. If it's non-compact, th then you have to work a little bit. The way we show that is we actually uh, take two different values of x0 and, and t0, connect it by an appropriate ray to 0, 1, and differentiate the f-functional along that ray. If you choose the ray just right, um, then you see that it goes down along the path. So the next thing we do, so sigma uh, 0 is assumed to be f-unstable, so we just deform it in that f-unstable direction. And, and then it's just a, basically a Taylor series um, argument. You define a function g, capital G, which depends on s, x0, and t0, just by, as you vary x0 and t0, and uh, um, vary s and the sigma s. So that's a nice function of, of three variables. Well, actually, I guess these two are single variables, and that's in Rn plus 1. And uh, you just show that that function has a strict maximum at uh, x0 equals 0, t0 equals 1, and s equals 0. The first step shows that it has a strict maximum if you fix s equal to 0. So if you keep s equal to 0 and then just vary x0 and t0, you know it's a strict maximum there. Whereas, uh, all right, OK. And so then the f instability deals with the cases a a as you move the other ones. OK, that's probably a, a good place to stop. Um, we don't know, right? So uh, we don't know that either. So if it's compact, then um, almost certainly the best, you, the lowest you can do is the entropy of the sphere. So there's a funny thing. We know that if you have anything, if you have anything compact or even non-compact, um, then you can deform its entropy to go down, except if it's a sphere or the plane. So that would certainly suggest that the sphere and the plane are, are, are the best values. The best, uh, certainly the plane is the best value. That fo follows from Bracky or from Brian White's regularity theorem. If you're from Brian White's regularity theorem, if your entropy is close, if it's like less than 1 plus epsilon, um, then in fact you get uh, full estimates, which implies it is a flat plane. So if your entropy is near 1, you're a plane. If your entropy, uh, could, I would imagine, I think, most likely if your entropy is near that of the sphere, uh, and you're a self-shrinker, then you're probably a sphere. But we, we, we can't prove that. We also suspect that there are no entropies between the cylinder and the sphere. We can't prove that either. Okay, so there are um, those, so this actually connects up with something Natasha was talking about this morning. It, those are actually useful things to look at. So suppose you wanted to ask, what about the, uh, something like the entropy between the cylinder and the sphere? Well, if your entropy is near the cylinder, the cylinder has entropy less than two. So there, you're guaranteed multiplicity one for blow-ups. So you, know, you get nice, smooth convergence to blow-ups and all of that. But, um, the, and the only problem there is there might be some crazy uh, self-shrinker we don't know about. Um, that uh, non, It would have to be a non-compact one, and it would have to have some very strange asymptotics. You know, it's, it's really hard to imagine what it might look like. 